years ago, Dana Holgerson was really on the hot seat. That's because his Mountaineers finished that season with a 4-8 and eight record. That's right, not even close to a bowl appearance. So the heat was on, and a lot of people were surprised that he was brought back last year. Well, last season, it didn't start well, but they did play respectable. You know, they lost the season opener to Alabama, but keep in mind, it's Alabama, and losing to them by 10 points is actually kind of respectable. And West Virginia actually did some good things in that game, even though they lost. It was a mediocre September for West Virginia, but October turned out to be their hot month, winning all four games that month and eventually costing Baylor a shot at the national championship playoff by handing Baylor their only loss of the season. But early November, heartbreaking loss to TCU, lost by a point, and the Mountaineers just didn't really recover after that. They would lose that game and would lose three of the next four to close out the season, including a bowl loss to A&M. But on the whole, you have to say the Dana Holgerson squad did some good things, you know, on offense at least, and finished with a winning record. So, not really that much talk this time around about Holgerson being on the hot seat. As a matter of fact, since joining the Big 12, this might be their most talented squad ever, despite the fact that they've got to replace some offensive big names. But defensively, I think that's where they're really going to be strong at. We'll talk about the defense later. Offensively, though, um, they're not going to have Clint Trinkett. But at times last year, they didn't have him anyway. Yeah, Trinkett got most of the snaps, and he was a valuable player, but also, too, racked up the injuries as well. When he couldn't play, you saw Skylar Howard come in, and now he's the full-time starting quarterback. Give you a little bit of an update on Howard. Last season, didn't throw a pick. Had eight TDs, no interceptions. It has to make you feel good as a Mountaineer fan, but be cautious because of the fact that he hasn't played a full season under center. And also keep in mind that, yeah, he didn't throw any picks, but he only completed 51% of his passes as well. But, again, that's a limited time. So we'll see now with a full year you know, under his belt how he does. And, of course, if that completion percentage can rise, then you'll see West Virginia's offense do just fine. The running game will be fine, too, if they can stay healthy. Russell Shell, remember the former five-star recruit, played his first year at Pittsburgh and did terrific, but then transferred. And, you know, last year, West Virginia had a little over 700 yards rushing, you know, close to 800, had seven scores, despite the fact that he didn't play all the time because he was troubled with an ankle injury. But complimenting him will be Wendell Smallwood, averaged five yards a carry, also had a little bit over 700 yards, but not as many scores, only two touchdowns for Smallwood. But these two guys... You know, should play big for West Virginia. And, of course, the health of Shell really watched that ankle. The receiving core, boy, you're going to miss these two guys, though, all right? And I have a feeling that even if one of them, you know, was, um, you know, was, was in the, on the 2015 roster, if he had at least one, you know, boy, if you had two of them, you know, West Virginia might be picked to win. The Big 12 would come close. Not having Kevin White or Mario Alford, you're not going to be able to duplicate this offense because of how much they met. Your top two receivers... Um, 2,400 yards in receiving, and also to a combined 174 catches. Um, that's next to impossible to try to replace. So now you have some guys last year who played a supporting role who have to be the headliners for, you know, WVU. We're talking about uh, Jordan Thompson, leading returning receiver for the Mountaineers, 49 catches, and also to, you'll have to kill Shorts, who had 24 grabs a year ago. Majority of your offensive line does return. Uh, Marquise Lucas, you know, right tackle, had 17 starts. You have uh, Tyler Olaski at center. You know, he had 16 starts in his career and 13 starts for the left guard. That's Adam Pankey. At right guard, though, guy who's going to get into the mix, you know, for the first time as, as far as a full role. You know, he's only had one start in his career. That's uh, Tony Matteo. And you'll have also, too, Kyle Bosch, the former Michigan Wolverine, probably will play that left tackle spot. And Cody Clay, he has some experience as well. You'll have him at tight end. So the experience is there for the most part for the Mountaineer offensive line. We'll see if they can open the holes and provide pass protection um, for Howard. Last season, the Mountaineers, um, you know, like I said, they, they did quite well offensively. You know, they were one of the top passing teams in the country. But without those two big threats um, in white or offered, um, it is going to be a tall order for them to try to get, you know, an offense that can rack up nearly 500 yards per game total. And that's what they did a year ago. The defense last year at times did not look all that comfortable. They didn't look like they were all the way ready. And that's because if it was a new defense, new defensive coordinator, and Tony Gibson last year in year number one, and at times we saw them struggle against the run and really struggle against the pass. The athletes are there for West Virginia. they got good technique, but last year it was just a question of getting familiar with the 3-3-5 defense. So now that they know what's expected of them and now that they know a little bit better how this defense works, 
And with nearly everybody back on the defensive side, West Virginia should be the most improved team defensively in the Big 12. And that will start with the nose guard, Kyle Rose. And Rose, you know, he's had 30 starts in his career. He's been productive. Of course, during the offseason, it was quite adventurous, like too adventurous in April. You know, he was arrested on several misdemeanor counts, um, you know, assaulting an officer. He had to get tased, you know, as a result of, you know, trying to restrain the guy. And Holgerson, during the offseason, you know, he made him clean the uh, made him clean the weight room. And also, too, during a spring scrimmage, made him sweep the, uh, the stadium bleachers as well. And I've been doing my due diligence to try to find out if he's going to have to miss any games um, as a result of that um, altercation with the cops back in April. If you know anything, please, uh, you know, please feed it to me um, on this particular page because, again, I've been trying to find out if Kyle Rose is going to have to miss any games for what happened just a few months ago. And then you'll also have uh, Noble Wachiku at defensive end and Christian Brown on the other side at defensive end. Linebackers, I think, are going to be strong for the Mountaineers, and that will include the veteran who you'll have at the uh, Sam linebacking position. And really, really watch how Nick um, Kudikowski plays because, again, he's a guy that could be anywhere and everywhere on the field, and he'll hit you too. And then at the Mike position, uh, you know, Jared Barber, and at the Will position, Shaq Pettyway. So the linebackers should be improved. And so should the secondary as well. They were vulnerable in this area last year, but now you've got um, these guys with a year under their belt and then more experience, and again, they're very athletic. And that includes Carl Joseph. You'll hear his name quite a bit this year for the Mountaineers, you know, now entering his senior year. The corner spot, you know, Daryl Worley, but he had to miss the spring because of a shoulder injury. So that bears watching. And also a Terrell Chestnut entering his senior year at the other corner. We mentioned that Joseph, one of the seniors on this team, is back at Safety. The other two safeties, because they do run the 3 3 5 alignment, you'll have uh, Drayvon Henry as well as KJ Dillon. So lots of experience there, and you'll see them become extremely more aggressive. Expect West Virginia's defense to maybe be the backbone of this team, where in the past it's been the Mountaineer offenses that have dictated games. Looking at special teams, no problem at all as far as place kicking. Josh Lambert, a Gross Award finalist from a year ago. Um, made 16 kicks last year of 40 yards or more. He was 30 of 39 overall, by the way. And the punter in Nick O'Toole, 42 yards per boot. So they seem solidified in that area as well. The schedule for West Virginia, September should be nice. First three games should be wins. The toughest of the three would appear to be Maryland, one of their rivals. That's on September 19th at Morgantown. Last season, West Virginia won this game on the road. So West Virginia, again, the toughest of those first three games appears to be that one against their Big Ten rivals, that's Maryland. You get a week off, and then Big 12 play. This is not going to be an easy schedule at all because of the amount of road games that they have to play and who they play, okay? At OU, and they have, you know, they've come close at times, but can't ever seem to beat the Sooners as a member of the Big 12. And this time you got to play them in Norman on October the 3rd. Doesn't get a whole lot easier the following week, although you get Oklahoma State at home, beating them the last two times. But Oklahoma State looks loaded this season. October 17th and October 29th, back-to-back -back games against, no question, the two best teams in the league, Baylor and TCU. Of course, Baylor has been wanting revenge on this one after what happened last year in Morgantown. This time, um, WVU has to play them in Waco. Twelve nights later, on a Thursday night, playing TCU. you got to play them in Fort Worth. Of course, that narrow loss that West Virginia had last year, that has to linger still a little bit. It's going to be tougher to try to beat them this time as you got to go on the road to do it. But thankfully, if you're a West Virginia fan, the schedule does ease up in November. Um, you know, Texas Tech and Texas back-to-back -back at home, although Texas has a good defense. And then November 21st at Kansas. Last time you played at KU, you know, the Jayhawks pull off the upset. I don't expect that to happen this time, though. And November 28th against Iowa State at home, the final home game. And watch out for December 5th at Kansas State. The Wildcats, you know, for whatever reason, seem to play very well against West Virginia. And you got to play them in Manhattan. So West Virginia is going to have their hands full at the end of the year, I think. The big thing for West Virginia is the defense, okay? They're going to be improved, but by how much? And how familiar are they now with that 3 3 5 alignment under Tony Gibson? That's going to be a big question. Plus the receivers, you know, trying to find um, the receivers you can depend upon because, you know, White and Alford gave you that stability as far as catching the ball, we'll see how this year's team does it. And, of course, the play of Skylar Howard. You know, can he continue to get better? And turnover margin. Last year, West Virginia was pathetic in this regard. Uh, they were minus 15 in that area, 119th in the country. That has got to get better. And maybe the defense with the experience, maybe that's where that will come in. 
I look for West Virginia, 8-4, and four, with a 5-4 and four conference record, and I think they'll tie Oklahoma State for fourth place in the conference. Big thing for West Virginia, that number of wins could go up if they can find a way to um, you know, finish strong last season. They did not finish strong, you know, losing four of the last five after that mid part of the schedule where they dominated. We'll see how things look in Morgantown this year, but I do think West Virginia is an upper-tier team in the Big 12. Thanks, everybody.